It's time for us to check back in with Sydney Sailor Farr and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. Family and Friends the mountains taught me just about everything I needed to know. My family and friends taught me the rest. When my youngest grandson, Eric Lawson, celebrated his eighth birthday, I went to his house to pick him up. When he answered the door, I announced to him that I had been instructed to come kidnap a little blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy who was eight years old. His blue eyes opened wide, and he looked toward his dad. I hurried him out of the house without telling his parents specifically where we were going. When Eric was younger, we would go shopping together. He loved going to the grocery store where they had a big round sun face as part of their decorations. He would climb up into the car so he would be sure to see it. I used to marvel at the look of pure delight on his face when he saw that sun face. Sometimes I would take Eric to the flea market at the Boone Square Mini Mall. As we browsed up and down the aisles, he would ask 10,000 questions. What is that used for? How did they make that? Why is that painted blue? Who owns all those books? And of course, the most popular question, will you buy this for me? When I picked Eric up for his eighth birthday, I was not surprised when he requested that we go to the Boone Square Mini Mall flea market. We walked up and down the aisles as he selected small items he could not live without. Then we discovered two bicycle helmets, one in good shape. He had received a brand new bicycle for his birthday, but no helmet. I bought one of the helmets for him and he promised to wear it every time he rode the bicycle. Something about our shopping trip was different this time and it took me a little while to realize what it was. Eric only occasionally asked questions about the items. I realized that since he was four or five years old, he had acquired a lot of information about things in general from school and television, and he did not need to ask me as many questions. He was growing up, and I wanted to hold him and savor every moment with him. Today, his family lives near me, and Eric is 17 years old. He rides his bicycle to visit me. We've always been close, but now that the girlfriends and learning to drive keep him busy, I don't think I will see him as often now. Time changes people, but you can still love them as before. Beloved Maple Tree My favorite tree on High Street in Berea is a huge old maple that stands in the corner of my yard. Fortunately, it survived the 1996 tornado, which did uproot a 50-foot white pine growing near the edge of my front porch. The maple, however, was unscathed. I'm so grateful it is still alive. My son Bruce loved that maple tree. He would climb up and be hidden by the thick limbs as he watched people walk or drive by. If the passerby was someone he knew, he enjoyed making noise and watching the person on the street try to figure out where the noise was coming from. In the fall, when full color comes to all the trees, the maple lights up my living room and the bedroom upstairs above the living room. It makes the room look sun-filled even when the sky is overcast. My husband Grant's mother, Jeanette Farr, opened her heart to six-year-old Bruce the first time Grant took us to her home in Black Mountain, North Carolina. One year, she visited us in October, just when the beauty of our maple was at its peak. The leaves were abundant that year and generously carpeted the whole front yard. Bruce introduced Grant to his tree, and it is a wonder we did not find her up in the tree with him. It was curious how, when the two of them were together, Bruce seemed older and she younger. They had grand times together. She often did things that made the rest of her family fear for her safety and got Bruce's promise not to tell Grant or anyone else. She did not try to climb the tree. However, she could and did play in the leaves with him. I have photographs of the two of them on the ground, covered with leaves, just their heads sticking out. Grant both laughed at and scolded his mother for lying on the cold ground at her age, but I thought it was wonderful that she, especially at her age, could get down on the ground and romp and play in the leaves with Bruce. Every fall after that, when the maple tree shed most of its leaves, I could not help but go walking through them. Leaves make such a satisfying crunch. I hope I never get too old to feel the urge to play in them or when October's burnished gold spills over into the brown of November, ache to be one with Indian summer days. 
I will always be grateful that Bruce had those years with his gran. She taught him that some adults could be trusted to keep secrets. She taught him how to use his imagination. She gave him lessons on how to look to nature for the simple truths and to trust the world of spirit for eternal values. Grand passed to the world of spirit in 1979, and though a bright light went out in the universe, its radiance still shines in our hearts and memories. She took Bruce and me in and made us feel part of her large family. And even though Grant and I are now divorced, other members of the family stay in touch with both Bruce and me, and we continue to visit them. Brother Fred. My middle brother, Fred, died in 1995 when he was 52. I married and left home so early that I did not get to spend as much time with Fred as I would have wished, and then he married and began raising his own family. After he became terminally ill, however, I saw Fred often, and we shared some good talks about our lives in the mountains, our parents, and each other. Our youngest brother, Leroy, wrote a tribute to Fred that is as eloquent as anything I could say about him, and I believe his remembrance is worth quoting in full. My brother was diagnosed with cancer in April 1994. His wife, children, our remaining brother, and six sisters all went through alternate stages of hope and despair in the next year and a half. I spent many days at his bedside talking, listening, and praying for and with him. Through this process, I found myself changing certain beliefs, old habits, acquiring more patience, and a deeper spiritual attitude. His faith and strength were shining examples to me. He was in charge from day one. He decided when to stop painful treatments and when to declare he wanted to die naturally at home. He asked forgiveness and achieved peace with God and other people. He thought of many details that he could take care of to spare his family after his death. He planned his funeral and picked out the burial plot, made a will, and took care of many other details, including adoption of his two stepdaughters. His wife, Jackie, became even more his partner, his helpmate, as he talked everything over with her. She kept a cheerful countenance for him, encouraging him, telling him little anecdotes about family, friends, and church. She kept demonstrating her love for him and taking care of him day and night. Through spending time with him, I managed to see my recent past in perspective to realize how small my troubles were compared to his. He talked about our lives as boys, about mama and dad, about his children. One day when he was very sick, he seemed to be in our childhood again. He replied seemingly to a question that he was seven years old. The most moving part of this was when he turned over on his side and began singing part of a gospel song with phrases like, I'm going to a better place where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. I am thankful that I got to spend time with him as much as I did. I witnessed how real and close God and the angels were to him and to us. Appalachia, Alaska Connection When I first met Jenny Carney in 1991, I had no inkling of the friendship we would come to share. Jenny Carney, an RN and a native of East Tennessee, moved to Alaska to live for almost two decades with her husband and three sons. At one time, they had lived in the Bahamas and befriended a young native woman who became their cook and housekeeper. They kept in touch with her after she married and bore four children, two sons and two daughters. Then their friend was tragically murdered. After a frustrating time working through all the legalities, Jenny and her husband adopted the four children and started raising a family again. During those years in Alaska, she lost touch with what was happening in her native region. One winter day while in the library at the University of Alaska at Anchorage, UAA, she found a copy of my bibliography on Appalachian women and was thrilled to see that someone was doing something about Appalachian people. Though we had never met and did not know each other, Jenny called to tell me how much she appreciated my bibliography. At the time, Jenny was teaching two English classes at UAA and using my bibliography and other lists of materials I had sent her. She wrote a proposal for a grant to teach a course on Appalachian women in literature. She received the grant along with permission from the university to teach the course on a one-time only basis. 
14 women and one man enrolled. Jenny called me when the course was assured. She invited me to come to Alaska and lecture on Appalachia at the university. With my son Bruce, I flew to Anchorage on September 25, 1991. Over the next two days, I spoke to Jenny's class and another class on American women writers, as well as at a colloquium and a town forum. I have never been more warmly welcomed in any place than I was in Alaska. Bruce and I were invited to dinner by several of Jenny's class members, and we enjoyed a potluck supper one night where we sampled some native dishes, including moose stew. After I spoke to Jenny's class, the students presented me with a picnic basket full of small gifts, a dream catcher, and homemade mincemeat, Alaskan cookbooks, a cassette tape, and other delightful surprises. The students said they had been reading about Southern hospitality and wanted to make me feel at home. Somehow they found out about my birthday, and the following October, back in Berea, I received a dozen roses from the class. I also received letters and telephone calls from them during the holidays. Word got around about Jenny's class, and other students became interested. A petition asking that Professor Carney be allowed to teach the course again was circulated, and it garnered 224 signatures. The university complied, and Jenny taught two more classes on Appalachia, one of them focusing on contemporary Appalachian women writers. Jenny and I kept in touch. She asked me about the doctoral programs at the University of Kentucky, UK. She planned to drive to Berea to meet me when she came to visit her mother in Tennessee later in the spring. I made telephone calls to UK and set up appointments for her. During her visit, she spent a day on the UK campus. She then applied and was admitted to the doctoral program. Jenny, with her four adopted children, moved to Berea in July 1993. Her husband remained in Alaska. I helped her find a big house for rent in the country. She and her landlady, Etta Anglin, became good friends and allies as they pursued their higher education goals and cared for their children. Jenny's children enrolled at Silver Creek, Foley Middle School, and Madison Southern High School. Living out in the country, Jenny says, enabled her to get in touch with her roots again. She talks about sitting on her front porch and listening to the evening and night sounds, watching the moon come up and millions of stars light up the sky. She says this healed her body and soul. She, in turn, has formed an amazing network of teachers and writers throughout Appalachia. Going to Alaska was a tremendous boon in my own life. It also enabled Bruce to fulfill a long-time dream to walk on a glacier. While in Alaska, we saw two big glaciers. We saw salmon trying to swim upstream, though they were dying because it was late in the season. We saw a huge iceberg near one glacier, but were barred from going any further because bears had been spotted nearby. Jenny Carney is one of the strongest women I have ever met. Knowing her has made me stronger and renewed my enthusiasm for being a writer and a member of the Appalachian Network of Educators and Writers. While she was living in Kentucky, Jenny told me she wanted to visit Stony Fork and meet some of my relatives who were still living there. We drove to Stony Fork on a Sunday. Our first stop was at a subsidized high-rise building for incapacitated and elderly people. My disabled brother, James, was living there in a tiny apartment that shone with cleanliness. Several of his foliage plants and smaller dish gardens were in his living room, and family photographs were hanging on the walls. After a short visit with James, we drove up the right fork of Straight Fork to the mouth of Stony Fork to visit with my sister, Della, and her husband, John. They lived in the old Ritter Lumber Camp, which was built in the early 1950s. When the mill closed down, the company offered to sell the houses on an individual basis. Della and John bought one, and their house is neatly painted and tidy. While Della and I caught up on family news, Jenny and John talked. John had to quit school after the eighth grade because there was no high school close enough for him to attend, nor school buses to the county high school 15 miles away. Perhaps as a result of his lack of formal schooling, John does not read much except perhaps a weekly newspaper, but through television he keeps up with what is happening politically in the nation. He talked with Jenny about local, state, and national politics and their impact on Appalachia. 
We drove up Stony Fork and turned into York Branch where my childhood home used to be and then up to Bingham Holler to the place where my grandparents had lived. Relatives of mine still lived in small homes along the road from York Branch to the head of Bingham Hollow. To my surprise, what had always been a dirt road was now paved. Somebody around here must know the right politicians, I said to Jenny. My paternal Aunt Betty and her husband William still live at the old home place. Betty is now in her 80s. William is a decade younger but has been on crutches for many years, having lost a leg as a result of a timber woods accident. The road literally stops in their front yard. When we drove up, we saw that they had planted flowers everywhere. Alongside the little creek, beside a dead stump, at one corner of a shed, among rows of corn and beans, in the back of the kitchen, each plant looking as if it had grown there naturally. Their five-room house was neat. The front porch and yard around the steps were swept clean. We noticed a field of corn on the hillside opposite their front porch. We asked how they had cultivated the ground. William said that they dug it up by hand, using only hoes. I could not picture a man on crutches standing on a steep hillside using a hoe. Aunt Betty wanted to show me her garden, so we left Jenny and William to enjoy the shady front porch. William told Jenny about his earlier life in eastern Kentucky and how after meeting and marrying Betty, he has lived in Bingham Hollow ever since. Jenny told me later how William shared his philosophy of life, his views on people in general, and what he thought of living conditions for people in specific locations around the world. He told her he had never learned to read. At the end of our visit, as we drove back to Berea, Jenny told me she could live in a place like Bingham Hollow or Stony Fork forever. Through Jenny, an educated and worldly woman whose vision is unclouded by stereotypes, I saw Stony Fork and my people with a new appreciation. My brother James, living in three tiny rooms, unable to get outside on his own, still managing to surround himself with life and love and William and John as politically and socially aware as anyone I know. We are constantly bombarded with stereotypes, both blatant and subliminal, all stemming from supposedly informed sources. Stereotypes have shadowed the Appalachian people from the first accounts. Too often the media, without knowing the people they are describing, look for the unique, the grotesque, or the tragic because that is what the tabloid mentality seems to find most appealing. Marijuana in the Mountains When their family was almost gone, Grandma and Grandpa Sailor moved from the head of Stony Fork down into civilization at the head of Bingham Hollow. Two of their children, my Aunt Betty, who was 13 years older than I, and Aunt Laura, who was only four years older, were playmates of mine when I was a child. It was a snug, safe place surrounded by folds of hills and valleys, and we were surrounded by kinfolk. My family worked hard raising corn, potatoes, and a big garden every year. We got milk from our one cow and eggs from a dozen or so chickens. Grandpa had a few apple trees and we always picked huckleberries and blackberries and gathered black walnuts and hickory nuts to eat. We lived in our own little world. On one hand, not much of Stony Fork has changed, but on the other hand, everything has changed. When I was young, there was a rough dirt road for jeeps and trucks from the mouth of Stony Fork up to the beginning of York Branch, and elsewhere there were only narrow footpaths. Today, there is a paved road all the way up to Aunt Betty's house. The number of houses and trailers alongside the creek and in any level spot to be found has tripled since I lived there. There is still grim poverty, but the people do not seem to dwell on that. They do what work they can find and eke out a living as best they can. They have hopes and dreams just like most people do. And they have marijuana. I was aware that marijuana was grown in the hills. I can recall numerous stories of marijuana crops destroyed by state police and of people being arrested or killed in the process. A talk with Betty and William brought it home to me. Two summers before Jenny and I visited, their garden was destroyed when a helicopter flew over the hills and dipped down into the hollows searching for marijuana. Their corn was shoulder high, steak tomato vines were loaded with green tomatoes just beginning to turn color. The wind blast from the helicopter blew down the tomato vines, 
even sucking some of the plants up by the roots, and the corn stalks were uprooted, twisted, and flung about. Even the onions and cucumbers did not escape damage. The helicopter flew over again and again as it crisscrossed the area. William complained to the state police office in London, Kentucky. Later, state police from both Frankfurt and London came to look at the damage. The Frankfurt police wrote down accounts and estimates and promised that something would be done. William asked the London policeman just what would be done. The officer told him, the reports will be filed in Frankfurt and that's probably all that will ever be done. Then he added, sorry for your loss and walked away. Betty and William never again heard from officials in either London or Frankfurt. An old cornfield sits near the top of the mountain in back of Betty and William's house. They said marijuana had been grown there before the raid, but not by anyone they knew. Odd things began happening at night around their house and outbuildings after the raid. For example, in the early morning hours, they would suddenly hear knocking on a back wall of their house, loud and insistent. They would get up and look everywhere, but could find no one on the premises. Aunt Betty is very superstitious, and she concluded that this incident was a supernatural warning of some impending disaster. William, however, insisted that human beings did the knocking. Their disagreement over the cause of the occurrence went on for several weeks. Finally, William decided to take matters into his own hands. He knew some men in other communities who had been involved with marijuana crops. Two or three of them were casual friends and happened to be in Bingham Hollow one day. William cunningly invited them to have dinner with him and Betty. They came to the house and enjoyed the good midday meal of fresh homegrown vegetables and cornbread. While they sat around the table, Betty mentioned the harassment they had been subjected to and her opinion that it was some supernatural warning. William jumped in with strong words about his guns and what he was going to do the next time it happened. As Betty and William told me the story, Aunt Betty said, I can't help but believe that it was a warning of some kind and that we've got to be ready for whatever comes. Yeah, it was a warning, all right, William said. They wanted to scare us into moving out of this hollow. Then they could plant marijuana in here. Is the harassment still taking place, I asked. No, not since I let it be known that I was ready and able to do, William said. Although Aunt Betty was very superstitious, William was more practical about human nature. He was strong and active, even though he was handicapped. It was amazing to see him and Betty on a steep hillside hoeing corn. Chapter 13, Foods We Love. As I look back over my life, I am impressed with how many memories I have of foods we gathered, prepared, cooked, and ate. Perhaps it is my memories of early childhood, warm kitchens, and scrumptious food that has made my kitchen the most popular place in my house today. When friends come to visit, inevitably, we end up settling down to talk in the kitchen. Each of us has different types of memories and recollections from childhood to call upon, but food often figures largely in those memories. After I married my husband and I had two sons, Dennis Wayne and Bruce Allen, Wayne is 11 years older than Bruce. We lived on Stony Fork when Dennis Wayne was small. Bruce Allen was born in Berea. Each of them has different memories about home cooking, perhaps because our lifestyle in Berea turned out to be very different from that in Stony Fork. Wayne has always wanted me to make chicken and dumplings, banana pudding, and molasses pie. Bruce wants hamburgers, chili, french fries, and chocolate cake. I see little reason in taking all day to cook something that can be done just as well in 30 minutes. At the same time, I value the knowledge and survival skills that were handed down from the pioneers to my ancestors and then through them to me. These skills and the knowledge and wisdom that accompanied them, hunting in the hills, tending the garden, feeding the family, and providing a warm kitchen are all part of the Appalachia I knew and still love. We worked sometimes from early morning until it got too dark to see outside. We also played hard. Three meals a day were never enough for us, and we looked for snacks in the afternoon and at night before bedtime. We had breakfast before daylight, dinner in the middle of the day, and supper in the early evening. During the winter, we snacked on walnuts, hickory nuts, beech nuts, and hazelnuts. Dad often gathered hickory nuts while he was out squirrel hunting, 
Squirrels were found most easily where hickory trees grew in the hills. Sometimes he would come home with his hunting pouch full of hickory nuts instead of wild game. Walnut, hazelnut, and beechnut trees grew close to our cabin and alongside fences and roads. We children eagerly gathered the nuts. I remember the golden days in October when we used to take coffee sacks made of burlap and head up the smaller ridges and coves to gather walnuts. The ground would be covered with leaves as rich in color as an oriental rug. When we reached a walnut tree, we would rake back the leaves with our hands and feet and find green hulled nuts covering the ground. For days after gathering the walnuts, we had the task of hulling them. I remember how embarrassing it was to go to school being one of only a few girls with my hands stained brown from the walnut juice. The stains could not be washed off. They had to wear off with time. We stored walnuts and hickory nuts in the loft of our house or in the hayloft of the barn. The smaller nuts we stored in jars and cans in the kitchen. A favorite snack of mine was black walnut kernels and cornbread. We kept a sack of walnuts near the wood box in the corner and a hammer by the hearth. We'd crack a bowl full of kernels, sprinkle them with salt, and eat them with a fresh piece of cornbread. Mm. More fascinating information shared by Sydney Sailor Farr in this memoir of her life. I love that, that little end in there because I love black walnuts. And Granny taught me at an early age to, to sprinkle a little bit of salt on them and eat that as a snack. I've never tried them with cornbread, but maybe the next time I make cornbread, I'll, I'll put me some little black walnut, a little pile there, and see if I think they go together as good as Sydney did. The beginning part of the book, I liked the talk about the maple. I don't know if you're like this like I am over the years. There's certain trees that I feel a kinship to, kind of certain ones that I really love and I really I've noticed, and it's mostly the ones either around my house. There's a black locust in the back that I especially like, and, and, and I can remember when it was just little bitty and now it's pretty big. There's a hemlock back there that I adore, that I love, that come from up the creek. And it's been moved twice. It could never be moved now because it's way too big. But during its lifetime of after it, we got it from up the creek and brought it here, it was moved to a different place. And it still lived and it's still living today. So I love it. Even the roads that I drive, there's several black walnut trees that I really love. Uh, and I notice them. And sadly, in the last few years, there's a couple that's in the pasture just down the road from me. And because of some variety of different issues, they, they've died, they're dead. So they're dead now. In that same pasture, when I was a really, really young girl, I can remember that there was two apple trees. And I can barely remember going to them and picking apples with my cousins. And then gradually they died and then um, the land changed hands and then it was made into pasture, so they were gone. There was also a princess tree, what's called a princess tree down there in that field, and it's now dead too. It's gone. Anyway, it's funny how you become attached to those trees, like Sydney was talking about the one, the, the beautiful one, when it would get those beautiful fall garments and would actually almost be like a light shining into her house. You can just imagine how beautiful that was. Because I'm passionate about showing a, you know, a good light on the people of Appalachia, what a wonderful place it is with wonderful people and the beautiful landscape and the wonderful way we talk and the food and all those kind of things, I really enjoyed that little part of wisdom that she shared about the stereotypes. How her friend, which she was from Tennessee, so she was kind of from the area too, but had spent all that time in Alaska. But then when she went to Stony Fork with her, how she was impressed with the, you know, the neatness and niceness of, of James's home and her aunt and uncle's home. But then also that, that how they were, uh, even the ones that couldn't read, how they were still intelligent. They were still able to carry on a conversation. They still knew stuff. They still noticed things in the world and, you know, thought about things in a deep manner, all those kind of things. So I really liked that part. She, uh, Sydney's right so many times because of the way we sound or because of so many stereotypes that have been just pushed over the years over and over and over. People really do have that um, kind of that opinion. And it's, it's not even that they do it in a, I don't think most people with malice, it's just what they believe because they, that's kind of been shoved at them so many different ways is that the stereotype that people in, in Appalachia are lacking education or lacking common sense or all those kind of things, uh, which is always funny to me because there's so many places of higher education in Appalachia. Anyway, but I, I liked that part of the book too. I also liked the part when they were traveling up there to Stony Fork and how shocked she was that how things had changed because Sydney had not been there in a while either. 
Uh, so many things. When I was a young girl, I was always interested in old ways. So Pap would tell me stories about, and his family had lived here in this holler, you know, so he spent part of his growing up years here. But he would tell me stories about even, you know, something as simple as the road used to go a different way. You know, I think about that sometimes when my, like he probably told my brother Steve that, but when we're gone, my kids, or even my, if I were having grandkids or Steve's grandkids, they'll never know the road used to go this way. You know, because not even in mine and Steve's life it was like that. Uh, but Pat told us that. And I'm sure he told Paul too, probably. But I think about those changes that Paul, that Pat told me about, things like that. He would point out and say, they're like over in the field, um, going towards Martins Creek. In the spring, you can see a huge, just huge old area in the cow pasture of daffodils. And Pat told me there was a store there. When he was a boy, there was a store there. So things like that, you think about the changes. But even in my lifetime here in the in Wilson Holler, so when I first, Pat first built our house and we moved here, there was two houses and one trailer. Now, I don't even want to tell you how many houses because I, I would probably leave one of them out that I'm not sure about. Um, but much different, the landscape's much different. Um, thinking about the paved road, locals, if you're a local person, Heading Road, I can remember when it was gravel. You know, I remember how, I, of course, the road I live in, it was on, it was gravel. The road I live on was gravel for many, many years until Corey and Katie was probably five, six, seven, something like that. It was gravel. But Heading Road, that's like one of the main kind of ways that people go today. And it was gravel when I was a girl. So all those kind of changes. Um, that Sydney had noticed. We all do that. We all notice. I've, I've heard lots of people say maybe they moved, um, they grew up in a small town and then they moved away and in years they come back and they, they have that in their mind and then they're shocked that the town's no longer little, you know, that it's it's a fairly good sized town or maybe it's a big town even by then and, and it's just hard for them to understand how things have changed. Same thing with Murphy. I can remember when the very first fast food restaurant come, it was a Hardee's. That Hardee's has been long since gone now. It's not there no more. But I can remember that. There was only Hardee's for a long time. And now, of course, we're like everywhere else. We have all the kind of fast food that most people do. So that's always interesting. Always a little bittersweet, too, to think about those things. But you can't stop change. You can't stop progress. Um, you just have to live your life every day with that gratitude. She kind of touched on that, too, is to be grateful for what you have and be pleased and, and enjoy what you what you got. Uh, reminds me of the old song uh, Ricky Skaggs sings, that hold what you got, I'm coming home, baby. But it's kind of the same thing. You can't go back to those places, but you can hold what you got, even if it's just the memories in your mind. So I hope you enjoyed this part that I read today. As always, I hope that you'll leave a comment and tell me what parts jumped out at you and what you liked. And please drop back by next Friday so that we can find out what happens next with Sydney Sailor Farr.